Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Claire Moat. Claire is a music journalist, a teacher, and is an owner of five horses. She also manages the band Burnt Out Wreck through her company, MMI Music Management. Hello and welcome to the show, Claire. Hello. Thanks for having me on here. Starting music journalism in the in sort of late 70s, 79, um, must have been a really exciting time because it's sort of like post-punk. Um, you've got the um, new romantics that started to come along. You've got the new wave of British heavy metals starting. There's a whole range of music going on. must have been really interesting. I, I didn't actually choose to be a music journalist. I am... I sort of fell into it because of the crowd I was with at the time. And we we were all sort of into music. And the, I knew people in bands and um, and people that wrote. And it sort of seemed that I would go that way. I mean, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. I actually wanted to be an anthropologist because I wanted to be different. Um, but the fact that I liked English and I was good at literature, I'm going to say I'm good at literature because, I mean, what's the point in saying that you're not so I'm okay well being okay doesn't get you anywhere does it so I was I was good at it and I enjoyed it so I ended up writing and getting you know working with some really really good bands and that sort of led off into doing PR doing publicity for various bands and getting involved and then so from 1979 onwards is probably when I was writing yeah in the 80s I had more opportunities but those, I was really lucky. I didn't. I didn't just go right. I want to be a music journalist, I, right. and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to follow this path. I mean, I did. I did some time on local papers, and I had columns and things that I wrote for myself. Uh, the other people sort of said, "Right, will you write this? Will you do this? Will you write that?" So you know, from writing about upside down crosses on church doors, um, right through to having a music column and writing reviews about bands that were local and then bands that were in London and then yeah. going on tour with various bands and writing about those. Um, it was just it was just one of those things that I was sort of, I sort of just melted into it. Almost just happened organically rather than you saying, oh, I want to be a music journalist and this is what I'm going to do. It just happened. Yeah, exactly. Because really, uh, when I think about it in logical terms, sensible terms, um, I should have been a lawyer. I should have been, because, and, and I should have studied to be a lawyer because there have been times with the band where I've had to sit down and figure out things for myself and read books on the law and terminology and just then go back to a lawyer and say, am I on the right track here? And then if if they're sort of singing, you know, if the page I'm singing from sort of resonates with what, what they're saying, then then I can say, right, okay, we need to do this. Um, because there are a lot of things uh, with with the band where you don't really need a lawyer, but you need to understand where you're going with this. And I think it would have been so much easier if I'd had that training. And then yeah. on the flip side, if I had, I could have had that training, but then I wouldn't know all the people that I know. Tell us about some of the stories, some of the bands that you interviewed. Who were your favourite interviewees? Probably David Coverdale on the White Snake tour in 1984. Yeah, I think you know that was a really good time. Cozy Powell was in, was there, uh, you know, and it was just the whole crew. Everything worked together. It was all good. It was fun. Um, the fact that he was actually out in a bar at the Britannia Hotel in Manchester, um, talking to people. And, he, and it wasn't just him and the band, it was the crew. Um, and and it, he was fun to talk to, and he was really into what he was doing at the time. Yes. So that, so that was a good one. And, yeah. you know, um, going up in the lift and sliding down the banister was also good fun. Um, you well, know, you, you did that, or he did that, or both no, of you? No, he didn't. I, I did that and did landed you? and la- almost knocked them all over, yeah, like oh. Skittles. But, yeah, I mean, such a long time ago, so many people. Yeah. I, think, I think dealing with Aussie was good. Uh, yeah. Sitting with Ozzy was good. Trying to talk to him, um, going and managing to get him a drink from the bar when nobody else could, and him saying, "How did you do that? Do that again." Uh, that yeah. was good. Yeah, uh, that was at the I think that was the Hammersmith Odeon. 
that was fun. But it's there are so many things. Uh, Van Halen, I suppose. Did you find it difficult to interview the, these guys? I mean, when yeah. I, I don't mean I don't mean sort of in awe of them, but I mean in terms of actually getting the getting the appointment to speak to them. Oh, it just used to happen. We used to talk to them. Did you? I, I very rarely had things set up. Like Dave Lee Roth, he was uh, Donington doing handstands and stuff like that, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> what? You know, and and you just look at these people, but then you're, you're wandering around and they come and talk to you yeah. and then your name comes up and they know who you are anyway. Even now they still know so who you, I am. So, yeah, you'd, bu- you'd built up a bit of a name for yourself anyway. Well, yeah, so happened, but yeah. I would, you know, you, you know, but I was never in awe of any of them because no. I was the one that used to say, okay, so, you know, with their finished album, I'd be the one who'd say, oh, is this a demo then? <laughs> you know, and, and, and <laughs> deliberately say things to to them that would um, wind them up. Yeah, but they knew I will that I was winding them up and yeah, just go, yeah. And then people would jump in and say, oh, you can't say that to him and everything. And they'd yeah, go, oh, yeah. it's okay. She, She's fine. We know who she is. And um, because as well as being a music journalist, a lot of people became friends anyway. So I saw them, uh, you know, out in the bars or wherever we ended up at, there would be always somebody that you knew and they would say hello to you and you would talk to them. Uh, and, and Gary would often say things like, well, she knows more people than I do, um, which in some respects is true, except for when you go to Glasgow and I didn't know any of the bands up there. No. No. Um, and they would say, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so. And I would just go, who? And they'd, they'd give me a long history and biography and I'd still be going, right. Okay, am I, am I supposed to know who you are? Because the chances are I don't know who you are. And I didn't because a lot of these bands up in Glasgow, I didn't see in London. They, they stayed in, they, a lot of them stayed in Scotland, didn't they, really? Well, I thought so. They were a big fish in a little in a town. And you come to London, you're a little fish in a big town. You know, so the chances are that I probably wouldn't know who you were anyway. Um, and I think they forget these things, but, you know... I, I just play on it sometimes because I, I wind them up. Listeners listening to this would probably think, wow, you know, speaking to all these rock stars and everything. How did you find the ego side of it? Because the perception would be, I guess, that might people might think, oh, crikey, you know, they've got big, big egos. How do you talk to them? What, how did you find that? Um, I used just to knock them down. Yeah. You know, it's very, with someone with an ego, it's actually very easy to level them. You know, because you, you just... You know, like, like you said earlier about, is this a demo? Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. this a demo? And and I am so and so, and you go and. Yeah. Or my favourite one is, oh, I'm sure you'll get over it. <laughs> you know, because because that you you know at the end of the day, okay, so you're a musician, and you you stand on the stage and you do this, and we all bow cow tat down to you, you know, and everything. Yeah. The actual fact is, no, you don't. It's like ACDC, for example. People used to think that they would be high and mighty because, you know, with the success that they had and things like that. But they weren't when you actually got um, got to see them. I mean, uh, there was uh, Brian Johnson, for example, and Angus. It was my birthday on one of their dates that they played. I can't remember what tour it was now. But they, they just sat and ate my birthday cake. Did they? Uh, yeah, and Brian got drunk with my dad oh, um, on whiskey. And my mum stood next to Cliff... Uh, Cliff Williams and said, I'll stand next to you because you're the tallest. You, you won't make me look so tall, yeah. you know. And and that was the sort of thing. It was, you know, you think that they're all going to be doing all this party stuff and everything. Well, actually not. They're eating my birthday cake. My dad's getting drunk with the singer. My mum stood next to the bass player saying, you know, but they, you know, because I don't know how my dad knew Brian, but he did. Um, and And I ended up, just sitting there and talking to all of them yeah. um and, and same when i used to go backstage um to talk to other bands i just used to end up sitting and talking and chatting um so so th- there are people with egos of course there are but you know i think once they realize that you don't care that they they, they this persona that they develop just disappears because how can you keep a persona up with someone who doesn't care yeah, and I, I guess the sad, the sad ones are the ones that carry on that persona when they're off stage. Well, there are some of them. We won't mm, name them, no. but there are there are a few. Um, I won't I won't say who they no, are. No, but, no so. of course not. No. Which <laughs> um, publications did you write for, and TV and radio and stuff? Oh, lots of radios, local press. 
Yeah. Uh, Bed Pusher Times. That was where I, that was where I learned loads of things. More music. HMV's magazine. Uh, oh, there was one music. One we called Musician something or other i can't remember all the titles uh now um but then obviously i left i left and actually got myself onto a marketing magazine called uh, sales and marketing management and business times and that and that paid a lot of you know that was my sort of day job that i ended up doing and and that i want to show gary a copy of that magazine and he just he just read it and he said, I don't know how you understand it. And how do you put that magazine together? And I said, I don't know. It's my job. I have to put it together. Um, because I was so you, you were sort of editing the magazine, were you? I was the editor's assistant. So I had to, lot, and when she was away, um, it was my job to step up. So you'd get uh, all the journalists to put their columns in. and, and uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It and, it, and it was done on a whiteboard in those days with, uh, with cow glue. So you ha- used to have somebody, you used to come up back from the typesetting um, and you used to come back in a in a copy. So you, And it, you would have to cut and paste it onto a board and then you'd have to send that back and then that would all get scanned at the printers and everything. So it was like a really old fashioned way of doing things. And then obviously the technology came in with the um, computers and then it's the same principle except that you do actually have a template to to put a magazine together, um, which is much, much easier. But yeah, I mean, I ended up working on a marketing magazine that was, um, it was really complicated and there was a, it had an offshoot, the business times. So all the things that were happening and then you had all the members subscriptions and everything going on and all that had to be like an insert. In and this was a generic marketing magazine for anybody in industry who was marketing, was it? Yeah, it was yeah. A, a proper print magazine, you know. And uh, and I, I, learned, I learned an awful lot on there with my editor, Chris, um, and Chris Hammond, and she was absolutely wonderful uh, and taught me lots and lots of things. And, of course, I could use those sort of um, skills when I was putting, you know, remembering how to put templates together for various other things. So, yeah, it was complicated, but it, it th- there comes a time when the, you know, the, the music writing isn't paying bills. So yeah, you, yeah. Need to be, you need to be working on a magazine. So when when you write an article, um, mm-hmm. do you have to sort of take several takes at it to get it where you want it to be, or do you edit it as you go along? I edit it as I go along. Do you? Yeah, um, but that's just me and how my brain works, you know. And then you read it at the end and you go, mm, "That'll do." Because I find the more you go over something, the worse you write. Um, so even with my essays uh, for uni, I. I'd write it once and then go through it, change some words, maybe change the paragraphs around, but I would never do two or three writes of it. I would, the second one would be the one that I handed in, uh, you know, cause it, you can spend forever like, like Def Leppard with their albums. You can spend forever and ever and ever trying to get everything perfect. And it's never perfect. Cause there isn't such a thing. Uh, yeah. So you may as well say, right, that is a really good attempt. That says everything I want to say, within the words um i can't make it any better no the more i spend on it the worse it's going to be so get rid of it send it yeah do it and then spend the next energy on your next one exactly Mm. and that's how you get through isn't Mm. it otherwise you'd be snowed under and you'd never get anything written polishing and polishing what advice would you give someone who was thinking of becoming a music journalist don't don't from a financial point (laughs) yeah don't yeah yeah well it's a, everybody wants to be one. It's like, you know, everybody wants to be on reality TV. I think if you're going to be a music journalist, I think you really need to go and study journalism these days. I think you need to study it. And I think what you need to do is you need to go and learn your craft on a newspaper or a magazine, be an intern or an apprentice, depending on what they do. So newspapers tend to do apprenticeships. Magazines tend to do intern. Um, I would I would cultivate all of those skills and then I would evolve from that, do it that way. I think that's that's what those are wise words, I think, because um, the way the way today is particularly, um, I wouldn't think unless you're at the very, very top of the, your game, you're not going to make much money being a music no. journalist. You're no, have you're to, not. You have to do something else, like you said, with, with your marketing thing. 
Um, and then, you, you know, if you've got a particular passion for music, you can sort of start doing that as well. Well, I think what you need to do really is you need to get all your skill set together. Um, and, and in this day and age, you need your skill set. Um, and I think you need to find out who's offering what, what universities are offering now, um, what people are offering on magazines, you know, various magazines offer internships, um, same as PR companies offer internships. You need to go and do this and get your skill set in order. And then if you, the opportunity comes up for you to actually write something and submit something somewhere on a webzine, like um, which is how people start, is that they start writing for webzines and they start writing for online people uh just by attending and then eventually get yourself going that way and then when you've developed more skills in your writing set um from writing for webzines or online mags then what you can do then is that you could submit it then to the print magazines and and just keep keep doing it you might get it rejected but there might come a day where you don't get rejected and at the same time still write keep writing so that you've got an online presence and people know who you are you know, just for any listeners that, and I, I think I know what a webzine is. A webzine is basically a web-based magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Def- yeah. 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 And, and you should, and, and a lot of sites have that where they pull all things together, um, whether it's news articles, um, whether it's album reviews, live reviews, anything like that. They just pull it all together. But if you keep writing and try and submit it eventually, you know, you can start developing your confidence and say, well, right, I don't have a problem in sending this to a person now. I mean, I mean, I have to say people like uh, Jeff, Jeff Barton and Gary Bushell, um, they, they used to give, if you used to write to sounds, they used to give you advice on about, you know, what you can do and how you. Oh, what, they, they give you things. feedback on, on your article? Yeah, oh, when you, if, if you submitted it and and it wasn't good enough or it wasn't quite right or you were too young or whatever it was, they used to write back and actually give you pointers. Critique it. You know, yeah, if you like. And, and uh, well, they were, I think the sounds are very good like that. I think there's stuff on sounds, people like Robbie Miller, um, Jeff Barton, Gary Bushell certainly were – were people that wanted people to succeed. Mark Putterford, for example, he he wanted to be the nef- next Jeff Barton and he got lots of advice and took advice on board. And then he went away and wrote books on, I think he wrote one on Thin Lizzy. Um, I don't, yeah, and he wrote one on ACDC, certainly. Um, and he went away and he evolved from writing from a magazine to actually being an author. Um, but he had to get his skills set together and he got advice from other people as well, and and uh, and that's how he succeeded. I mean, he died a few years ago now, but he did actually achieve all the things he wanted to achieve. He did want to write a book on ACDC, and he did. Mm. Um, that, was, that was going to be one of my questions for you, for you actually, um, Claire. Have, have yeah. you have you you might have already done one, but have you ever thought about writing a book? I have thought about writing a book, and I am partly writing one. I keep saying that I need to sit down and write it. Yeah. Um, but I haven't um, in full. I know where I want to go with it. Um, so you know the story. Is, is it fiction? Partly, yeah. it's to do with the Russian Revolution, the Romanovs. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's nothing to do with music. Even though I've been asked several times, "Do you want to write the heavy petting book?" The answer to that is no. Um, I mean, think about it logically. I'm married to the drummer, so I might be a bit biased. Um, also I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the music, so that subconsciously might come across, mightn't it? Um, well, I guess so. I, was, I guess you've got to be fairly enthuse, enthusiastic about well, yeah. the music. So if you were writing one about ACDC, you'd have passion there. Well, I'd write it. Yeah. Mm. But even so, I still, you know, my, it would still be skewed, wouldn't it? Um, I have a friend, uh, Darren Johnson, he's just written a book on the suite and I think he's doing one on Susie Quattro. He might have already done it. Um, but he, I know that he said it, it takes the time to get everything going and get it all done. Um, and, he, and he's written it. But he started off um, writing 
as well. And then he's gone into the authorship, but he's doing something about something that he's, he's really quite passionate about. Um, and, and it comes across in his writing, which is great because that, that transfers to the reader. But I'm just giving you an example that Darren Johnson has got this book on the suite and, and it's really, really good um, because all his passion from that type of music and all um, living that era and being getting into it uh, is that it all comes across i think you can buy it on amazon it's probably yeah. worth a read if you like that yeah. sort of thing well but it I'm, was it was my my sort of growing my, i was weaned on the on the glam rock days t-rex slade the whole lot sweet yeah yeah i like it. i like i like slade i don't i don't know about sweet really but I, I i like all that stuff but i'm at the moment i'm sort of I, I like things like the medieval babes. I like listening to the medieval babes, Catherine Blake, um, that sort of thing. That's the sort of, you would never think it, but that's the sort of thing that I really like listening to. Uh, and sometimes I like listening to sixties music. I think, you know, if I had a singing voice, I'd like to be in a sixties all girl singing band, but I never quite got there. And I'm too no. old now, but I, I just, I just sort of feel, you know, that this book will come out when, yeah, when I actually sit and and I really put my head into it, um, and I did for a while, a year or so ago, especially during COVID, but then other things take over and you don't. I've interviewed quite a few authors, and um, one of the things that comes across is um, the common thread seems to be just write a bit every day. Yeah, I and did. Just, you know, and you did. Uh- I did, and yeah. then and then it's it's all there. But if yeah. I, you know, and I like to write things by hand. I don't like to type it. I like to write by hand. Why, why it's is just, that? I don't know. I feel com- feel more comfortable. Does it feel, feel more, more authentic? Yeah, more personal. Because your whole your whole sort of brain to your fingertips is actually doing something. Yeah, I think so. But I also think that because that's probably the way that I wrote essays and yeah. articles um, and then typed them up old school if you like that's yeah. probably still ingrained in there but it's more I do natural. Like, yeah I think so but I like the idea of it's in my book it's my book it's my handwriting yeah. and it's my thought therefore it makes it mine even if it even if it doesn't go to print and somebody finds it it's mine you can identify with it because it's yeah. my handwriting yeah my and name. if you if you send it all to your, your family and friends as a christmas yeah. present or something like that you know oh i'd never uh, do that I'd never you wouldn't do that. no <laughs> oh you'd rather have the general public <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i, I yeah. you know I, not that i'm bothered about um them criticizing it because i know that they couldn't do any better to be fair um and they wouldn't sit and do it i just i just think that um that if i was going to do it and and it went to to a publisher then i would expect to see it in print and they could they would see it when everybody else saw it um and that's the way it would be but i just think it to, to actually uh, physically finish a task like that would be very difficult what other projects do you have coming up uh i don't i don't really have anything apart from getting this band out on the road um i think my project is going to be just making sure that everything is ready for that um and I guess, you know, probably doing some tutoring or something somewhere along the line. But again, every day is different. So I don't know. I don't know. It's been great talking to you, Claire. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on here. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. 